We're going to read some text today and um, just a little, a little teaching section. It's this section, when we, when we do Holy Communion, many people do it different ways. Um, in, a, in a Baptist church, you'll, you're, it's going to be more of a memorial. We do this in remembrance of, of our Lord. Um, in mainline Protestant churches, which would be Presbyterian, Lutheran, uh, Methodist, and Episcopalian, uh, you will see a, a little bit of move away from how the Catholics look at it in that we say the, the, the elements is the representation of the body of Christ. It's a, it's, it's, it's a step towards a, away from the more memorial. It says, and it's on the belief that, that God or Jesus said in Amplified that he would meet us there in the sacrament. So we see that. But in the Catholic Church, it is the, the body and blood of Christ. It is actually the, it becomes the body and blood of Christ. And that's a, it's a, it's a process called transubstination. Um, it was hotly debated um, hundreds of years ago. People died and fought big battles over the meaning of communion. It's amazing how, um, how violent it got. But, in, and if you, uh, in Catholic theology and, or Eucharist theology, this is the scripture that, that they draw off of, and um, it's it's if you it's a literal it's a literal reading that they take, and and, and therefore it's very very justified, and um, I, I honor that that belief, and uh, but we 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 follow that a little bit, not quite as much that, but the representation. Because of, if you'll ever notice, we, we do not pour any communion that does not get partaken of. It does not go in the garbage. Um, it is either consumed or it is, is the bread will go outside to the, um, the animals or, or, or whatever. So there's, uh, there's some commonality there, but it's, their, their, their doctrine is based off this right here. And it can be a very disturbing doctrine um, or reading when you hear the language that it uses, um, because it, it, it sounds almost uh, cannibalistic. You know, it says, "You must eat my body and you must drink my blood uh, to be saved and to have eternal life." And and that's that's disturbing words. As a matter of fact, even later on in in the scripture, um, now the the twelve are, are kind of there, but they're when it says the disciples, it says there's a lot of disciples right now. Jesus is a really popular person. He just fed 5,000 people and everybody, they try and catch him and, and, and crown him the king. That we're going we're gonna to go get this guy and make him our king right now. And Jesus says, hey, wait, no, let's, 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 let's back off on this. And later on in the scripture, uh, what parallels, it's the feeding of the uh, the multitude, and, and then our scripture we're looking at, and, um, and then Jesus says that the first thing some of the disciples say, maybe not the twelve, but the, the, the group, says this is a hard teaching. This is a hard teaching. And, and the minute they say that, they have pulled away and, and they're no longer disciples. And, and as Jesus goes to his, his death, it, the process plays out over and over and over again. This is just getting too hard. You know, I, I don't know where this is going. When it was, you know, when we were being fed and there was really no talk of somebody dying, um, we were good. But man, this is just getting a real, real weird and it's taking, you know, too much. And so I think I'm going to step out now. And we think, wow, how, how could they possibly do that? Well, we do it. We do it every day. And when I talk about people, when Jesus... Um, the deeper you go, the deeper Jesus draws you in. That's a prime example. At some point, you just go. It's too uncomfortable for me to move any closer to Jesus Christ. Am I alone here? No. At some point, everybody says, I don't know if I can go any further. Peter did that. Peter did that over and over again. He denied Christ. He had been... A close companion. He had, he had talked to Jesus in ways that we would never will. You know, he had cast doubt on Jesus. He had been rebuked by Jesus. And, and 
And he knew what was going to happen. Jesus told him what's going to happen. And he he said, I can't take it. I I can't accept it. So even Peter, who stood in the presence of God, who walked on the water, at some point said, I can go no farther. And so, that's what we got to speak to today. And that's what we continually speak to, is that why are you where you are? Why am I where I am? And why am I not closer? And why am I not totally living for a living Christ? What is the issue? What is the issue? What is my issue? What is my stumbling block? Especially me, you would think, I got the robe on. Many times we, we, we think that the person standing in front is the most righteous or most holy or most com- connected with God. And I'm just here to tell you, at certain times, it's not true. I'm going to share something with you. I received so much inspiration from you that you'll, you'll never believe it. You, you, if, I, if I told you how much Kay and I draw off of you, you wouldn't believe it. Because your adversity and how you handle it and, and how you walk with Christ and how you walk through dark times is an inspiration to us. Because I've seen people in my and our ministerial life who have gone through horrendous things tragic losses that I look and I you know, I don't know that I could do that. And if I did, I don't know that I could do it as well as they did it. So, there are, there are saints among us. There are people sitting next to you who are stronger than you will ever know. But we all need help now and again, right? Because it's an ebb and flow. We are, per- we are tried, we are, like you say, when you pray for something, the trial comes. And then, then you rebound and you come back stronger. It's kind of like how vaccines and inoculations work. Give them a little bit, build up some antibodies, send them out. It's the way our relationship with Jesus Christ is. We go through some trials and tribulations. Somebody told me yesterday... They went through some things early in their life and their children say, I do not know how you did that. You probably don't know how you did that. But you did it. And you handle things now that you don't even know how you handle them. Because God prepared you to handle the big things incrementally. Amen? And this comes in the sixth chapter. And they, for a little historical context, when, when, um, we'll call it um, not full sacrificial atonement, but the sacrificial process, the way um, that that God instituted the sacrificial program, we'll say, in early Judaism, that um, the people are sinners, the people um, are, are, uh, cannot live up to God's standards, and so they have to bring a sacrifice, uh, a, a living sacrifice to God, and then the priest would take that and process it, um, drain the blood out of it and process it, but the, um, they, they didn't waste everything. There were certain animal parts that were burnt, and, but then other parts were given to the priest and, because that was part of their payment. That was part of their compensation. And so it was a whole process, and, and so they didn't just, just slaughter something and throw it on a fire pit and just let it, let it burn, and, and that's, that's not the way it was. But there were parts, there was a process, the priest did this, and so everyone understood it. And even people um, who were not uh, under the Judeo 
or in the is, is family of Israel, they would understand it too because sacrificing was a big thing back then. Um, there was human sacrifice, there was fetal sacrifice. So when Jesus talks about and uses this language, everybody gets it in that time. We don't really get it right now. That's why it's so kind of offending to us to hear these words. But everyone would have understood what he was saying because part of the sacrifice was eaten uh, in those days. And so here we, we pick it up on the 32nd verse. And Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. He's talking about the manna during, in the wilderness. But it was my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Say that with me. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And now that's a problem. They, they were like, I don't know where this guy gets off saying this, but I don't know where he gets the authority, but it's not right. And then in, in, in 48, he says, I am the bread of life. He says, your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that the one may eat it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. That's a very provocative statement. Whoever eats of this bread, that's what he's saying, whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. They made no connection about the, what was fixing to happen. They, they, they just did not understand this. And the Jews then disputed amongst them, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And so Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and this is the doctrinal Eucharistic text for the, the Catholic Church, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is the true food, and my blood is the true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. In those early forms of sacrifice, in, in not in, but in a pagan way, not in, in the, the, the Judeo way, is that when they sacrificed it and then they eat it, they, they would, people would understand this, when I eat the sacrificed meat, then I am communing with that God, the little g, little g because it's not, not this God, then they would make that connection that now that they would think that God abided in them and that they... They were good to go. And it, it, was, it was just like what we talked about later on. We see where the Holy Spirit abides in us. It would be much the same thing. And I am them. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate. And they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these were while and was teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. And the very next verse, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, Kay and I, we try, and most of us, we try to live a pretty decent diet. And, and I, I eat this way. It's obvious that I don't just eat, eat a lot. But when I eat something, I try and figure out what's the most benefit. If I eat something, how am I going to get the most protein? How am I going to get the most nourishment from what I eat? And so I eat like protein bars and stuff like that. Because I want a high concentration of something that benefits me. 
And so when we look around and we, we partake and we live in the world that we live in today, look at what you partake. Look at the things you watch on TV. Look at the things that you read. Look at the things that you, you follow on Facebook. And just go, is this feeding me or is it killing me? Is this the bread of life or is this things of death? Because they look the same sometimes. You can get down, go down a, a channel and all of a sudden you say, this is, this is not what I thought it was. This is not edifying me. I used to read a lot of novels before I was in, uh, especially before I was in ministry. I love to read novels. But, but now I don't read novels because they don't edify me. They don't, it's now to me like wasted time to sit down and read for hours and hours a novel. I'm not, if you want to read novels for relaxation, that's fine. But I'm telling you, there's things that you can read that will edify you and teach you about the Lord and will, will draw you closer in. There are things that you can do. There are things that nourish you if you seek them out. And will gird you up and make you a spiritually healthier person. The diet of what you put in your soul and in your mind is just as important as what you put into your body. We need to go on a diet, a spiritual diet, maxing out proteins and things that edify us, the Word of God and, and, and Scripture. I know, I know friends, I know a young man who knew the Bible front and back, but he was not reading any commentary on it. So he really never knew what it meant that he was reading. Amen? There's so many things that you have to do. There's so many aspects that God has provided, and there's so many ways for Jesus Christ to speak to you through so many um, anointed people. If you take the time to seek them out and get in a group or, or ask me or somebody, a fellow Christian, is this what I should be reading? Is this orthodox? Is this good teaching? Or is it just division? Is it just here to cause division? Because some people write things just to cause division. Some people start ministries just to make money and have influence. Hard for you to believe. Hard for you to believe. Assess what you are doing in your spiritual life and what you are feeding yourself and what you are seeking out. Because God is drawing you closer. He will let you stay where you want to stay. But that's not where He wants you. Amen? Amen? Speaking of feeding, Rhonda, we'll, come up, we'll close out. I'll make the blessing and we'll go down and eat.